Thank you very much, Viju. Uh, thank you, Joe, uh, for the introduction. Uh, with this, I would like to obviously start off with uh, with the discussion. A very good evening to all of you. Uh, my name is Dr. Yamal Patel, and I am today wearing the hat of one of the members of Pan-African Society of Endometriosis. Can you see my slide? Yes, we can, Yamal. Right. Great, thank you. So I'm going to be talking about uh, easier endometriosis anatomy up to date. So uh, with this, uh, we are going to be... Um, my greetings from Third Park Hospital, Nairobi, and Lap Mashinani in Kenya. Uh, this is what we are looking at. And once we come across a pelvis like this on entry, uh, without your guidance to go through, uh, it's impossible to try and tackle such a pelvis. And that is what we're going to be giving you a guide on, on how to, how to navigate yourself through a pelvis that is distorted by this condition of ours called endometriosis. I have no disclosures. Our journey today is going to be discussing on why we need to know the anatomy for endometriosis, which anatomy is important, when do we need it, how do we learn it, and where do we apply it or where do we use it. So in regards to why, there are a number of questions that need to be answered as to why we need it. Number one, because endometriosis causes anatomical changes uh, due to its invasive and infiltrative nature, inflammatory nature, fibrotic, and causing extensive adhesions all over the pelvis. Why? Because if we have to and decide to go in for surgery, this surgery is complex and is going to be with po many potential complications, including a very high-risk surgery for visceral injury, fistula formation, hemorrhage, nerve injury with related deficiencies, and therefore there is a high chance of incomplete surgery if you're not aware of your anatomy properly, leading to possible residual disease and recurrent disease, therefore a very high chance of repeated surgeries. So without the anatomy and the guide to this type of a pelvis, proceeding with endometriosis surgery would be close to impossible. Further, why? We need to do safe surgery. We need to do complete surgery. We need to be confident as a surgeon when we're going into such a pelvis. We need to decrease the time that we would need, which would help if we know the anatomy and our way around that pelvis. We need to be consistent every time we handle such a case. It's not luck that we are relying on, but we are consistent, we are predictable, and therefore we can give better outcomes to such people. We need to master it because when we are more, it makes us more efficient and therefore gives us the faster surgery. It makes it more effective, giving us better results. It makes us more confident and predictable as surgeons, making us safe, and it minimizes complications for our patients. When do we need to know this anatomy? Every time endo is seen, we need anatomy knowledge. Every time anatomy is distorted, whether it's uh, due to endometriosis or otherwise, we need to know the anatomy. We need to know the anatomy to identify and secure certain structures that are important and in multiple previous surgeries. And once in a while we are lost, we need to know the anatomy to get a landmark to move on from. Which anatomy would we need to know? The intraperitoneal, which all of us would probably know, but more importantly, the retroperitoneal the visceral and the pelvic organs, the bowel, the bladder, the ureters in specific. We need to know the vascularization anatomy because if we need to secure ourselves from bleeding major vessels, then we need to know that anatomy. The nerves to avoid damage to these nerves, lymphatics and avascular spaces to guide us in which plane to dissect so as not to land into unnecessary bleeding. How do we study anatomy? Traditionally, we were studying anatomy by theory and dissecting cadavers. But over time, we have learned this through surgery. Nowadays, we learn it through the minimal invasive surgery, either on a cadaver or on a live surgery. 
And the advantage to this is magnified, accurate understanding of the relations and more clearly displayed and recorded to revisit with an archived uh, recording that we could easily do. And this was our past knowledge of or learning of anatomy where we would have 20 people around a table and hardly be able to see. Nowadays, we have magnified, recorded, and open to all anatomy. So a brief of the intraperitoneal anatomy as we move on. When we go in, this is a normal pelvis, not with much pathology. But when you look around, you have the ovary, the ovarian ligament, the round ligament, the, the tubal structure, the tuboconvul, the uterus there in the middle, going over to the other side, the ovary, then attached with the, in, the IP ligament, infundibular pelvic ligament there. You can see the external iliac vessels there, the IP ligament crossing over there. You see the ureter, and this is the right side. The ureter on the right crosses over the external iliac. You can see the external iliac, and it crosses over the external iliac artery and vessels, and that's the bifurcation into the of the common iliac into the internal iliac and the external iliac over which this ureter crosses over. Moving further up, you can see this common iliac arising all the way from the aorta in the middle and the bluish structure on the side, which is the, that's the inferior vena cava. So this is the structure that we, this is the anatomy we all see. That's the sigmoid and the rectum down there. The sacral promontory where there is the, the vessels uh, of importance, the, the left common iliac vein, that is the lateral pelvic wall. You can see the bluish structure here. That's the vein, the iliac veins. And as you move further, as you look at uh, further, when you pull, I'm going to show you, that's the ureter all the way down here. When you pull this structure, you can see this fold here. And that's where the hypogastric nerve follows. And it's important to make sure that this nerve is secured. Uh, otherwise, you'll end up with residual uh, visceral damage injury, causing issues on the rectum, the bladder, and the sexual function. You can see the ureter going all the way this side, and then you will see it crossing, the, the vessel crossing over up there. And that's the, it's not very clear here because we've stretched it, but let's go to the opposite side. The left side, the, the ureter crosses over the common iliac and not the external iliac. So they cross over at different levels. On this side, you can easily see the, the vasculature, the, the vessel there. See this vessel? That's the, the vessel that is the uterine artery crossing over the ureter just underneath here. So this is intraperitoneal anatomy that we all see and know. Now, the issue is when you look further down here, look, look further down here and you will see there is a small nodule here. And this nodule here is a nodule of endometriosis. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. The pathology, the actual disease in this patient was in the rectovaginal septum going further down. And you can imagine this patient complaining of pain, severe pain during intercourse, severe pain that actually impacts her family life and has led her to reach probably to a point of, of divorce. And all you see is that little area. So if you don't know how to approach that and you think that burning that tissue is gonna be enough, that's not gonna help. Now, moving on. Anatomical surgery. What is anatomical surgery? Is use of this science of anatomy that we know to assist with surgery, to make sure that we do a complete surgery, an adequate surgery that is radical to the disease, in this case endometriosis, but conservative to the function of the visceral organs around there being a benign disease. So this anatomical surgery requires adequate and in accurate knowledge of anatomy. Technology and vision has improved this understanding of anatomy to be used in surgery. We also have something called predictive anatomy. So not only should we be accurate, but we should know what lies where, 
what comes next before it appears. So it's in anticipation based on the knowledge. To anticipate your structure before they appear is what is predictive anatomy. And when there's a distorted pelvis, predictive anatomy is what's going to get you to the end of that journey safely. So our learning objectives, we'll be learning the key topography of the pelvis, the key structure of the anterior abdominal wall, the vascular anatomy of the side wall in the retroperitoneum. We'll discuss surgical strategies to minimize risks to these vital structures and techniques to dice. Anatomy is covered in gross anatomy lectures. I'm gonna go through it, but now into the peritoneum once again, the anterior abdominal wall, very important. We have the anterior peritoneal folds in five sides. The median, which is that one there, the dome of the bladder to the umbilicus that is covering the obliterated uricus. Two medial, which is the obliterated umbilical arteries that are continuation of the internal iliac arteries anterior trunk. And two lateral uh, folds, which are overlying this inferior epigastric vessels, an important landmark for secondary entry. The vessels of the anterior abdominal wall, the most important one being the deep inferior epigastric artery, which is a branch of the external iliac artery after it exits the pelvis, just there, and it now comes back up and goes under the rectus muscle and cannot be actually transilluminated. We can't see this by transillumination. These are the superficial vessels that we're talking about. What do you see on entry? We've just discussed, you will see these three structures. And now moving on further, we have done the anterior abdominal wall. Now let's look at the posterior wall. The posterior wall, we have this entry into the pelvis, which is a sacral promontory. And you have this structure that is the IP ligament and this big pouch, that's the pouch of Douglas that we are interested in. So the pelvis starts at the sacral promontory, which is the summit of the pelvis. And it's important to know that none of the pelvic pathology crosses the sacral promontory. So this is our pinnacle, the sacral promontory. And you now, that's the highest point any pelvic pathology can climb. And now you discuss and deal with the pelvic pathology below this level. At this level, the important things of, impo of, of note are the common iliac vessels now bifurcate into the internal and external. The ureter is crossing over from the lateral to the medial side into the pelvis over the bifurcation of the vessels. We saw them at different levels on the left and the right. We have the superior hypogastric nerve plexus, which is a sympathetic nerve plexus, which then unites and forms the left and right inferior hypogastric nerves that go down the side of wall of the pelvis, medial to the ureter, as we had discussed. And the sacral promontory forms the initiation point in case we have to go parietic. We need to know now, how do we enter this retroperitoneum? So what are the doors to this retroperitoneum? We will go through them one by one, but important is the round ligament, where we could go anterior to it, posterior to it, or through it if we're going to get rid of the uterus in a hysterectomy to get into the retroperitoneum. We have the IP ligament. We could go lateral to it or medial to it to get into the retroperitoneal space. And we get into the midline spaces through the peritoneum between these structures in the midline. We'll be going through them. That's the bladder, the uterus with the cervix, and the rectum posteriorly. If there are adhesions due to previous surgery or due to uh, anatomical distortion due to endometriosis, you do not enter these spaces directly in the midline. You now use a lateral approach. So this is going to be into the retroperitoneum. Just a look at what we are going to go through today. Of landmarks and limits, knowing the anatomy of these vessels is going to help you navigate through this vessel pelvis to be a better and safe guide for dissection and minimize the risk of major bleeding. You can't approach this area without knowledge of the anatomical vasculature in this area. This is the labyrinth of the pelvis. The main vessels we are interested in are the uterine artery, the ovarian artery, 
the internal iliac artery, the vaginal arteries, etc., because these form the labyrinth of the pelvis. Important to understand our surgical mantra, we have lateral vascular control in the pelvis. Except ovarian and rectal vessels, the majority of these vessels are actually supplying the organs from the lateral pelvic wall coming medially. Um, external iliac arteries, important uh, anatomical point. There are no branches on the anteromedial aspect of this vessel that we have seen. So it's safe to dissect it in endometriosis or in, in a malignancy of the pelvis, and it's used for ileobturator lymph node dissection in malignancies. But you are not going to encounter any branches in the pelvis in this area. The vein is usually medial and inferior to the artery. The origin of the inferior antipigastric vessel is the one that we have to be focused on because this vessel and the deep circumflex iliac vein inferiorly, anteriorly there are the caudal limit of this, but that vessel is out of the pelvis area of interest in endometriosis for us. The most important vessel to us, the internal iliac artery. This iliac artery is a branch of, or is a bifurcation and a branch of the common iliac, where it divides into the anterior, I mean, and ex external and internal. As soon as the internal and external branch is done, below the bifurcation, two to three centimeters below that, it bifurcates into, again, the anterior division and the posterior division. The posterior division heads posteriorly, as it's saying, towards the gluteal area and is hardly of interest to us because we don't need to go that deep unless you're going into towards the neuropelviology area or the, the, the gluteal area. So our interest is in the anterior division. In this anterior division or the anterior trunk, the main first branch that actually crosses across this area as you dissect next to it would be as you dissect parallel to it, would be the uterine artery that branches roughly around five to six centimeters medially from this vessel. The only lateral vessel branch is that you would come across with the obturator artery. And the next branch after the uterine would be the superior vesicle artery in front. So as we look here, we have the internal iliac, we have the uterine branching there. You have almost five to six centimeters of anterior trunk here. And this continues ahead, gives us a branch of the superior vesicle and continues ahead as the obliterated hypogastric or obliterated iliac artery. The obturator artery is more of important in, in, in oncology, not as much to us during endometriosis, but if you get endometriosis nodules in this region, then obviously knowing that this ves this ves uh, nerve and the vessels are deeper to it will need to be spared when you're dissecting in this area. The uterine artery, a very important vessel for us, is best visualized in this space. We'll be going into these spaces. Is the first medial branch of the anterior trunk of the internal iliac artery, roughly five to six centimeters from the origin. It crosses over the ureter horizontally and anteriorly, and it divides into the descending cervical and the ascending uterine branches before piercing the substance of the, the uterus, as you can see here. So this is the area that we are looking at. If we need to take and maybe ligate it from origin, then definitely that is the area of interest for us. Uh, over time now, the anatomy has a bit changed. And if this is the ureter here, it's now realized that it actually is not only that the vessels are anterior to it, it's the artery that is anterior to the ureter, but the veins are be below the ureter. So the ureter enters the fork between the ureter, between the uterine artery and vein. So this is important in what way? It's important because when you get a bleed in this area and you're not sure if you, did, if you just start buzzing blindly, you could easily damage a structure like the ureter in the process. So when you pull this ureter upwards 
And if you have in if you're in this area and you're bleeding from uterine artery, you might find that that uterine artery actually the arterial bleed stops. But when it's venous and you keep on pulling on this, the venous being below it will continue bleeding. So it will give you a guide as to what is happening and how to therefore secure this ureter before you try and burn the vessel. So that is the, the older knowledge, water under the bridge, ureter lies beneath the artery. That is true even today, but more important is actually where the water is lying between two bridges, the bridge of the artery in front, the bridge of the vein below, and this ureter with its mesentery in between the two. Now, that is important also to know that these uterine veins are actually multiple and they are multiple tributaries that will drain and come towards one to finally become one vein that joins into the internal iliac vein. So now we look at the anatomy in the retroperitoneum. So when we have seen this, these are the vessels. I just want to show you an internal picture of the same, because this is important to understand as we proceed further from here. So we have this retroperitoneal dissection, the common iliac artery dividing into the internal and the external on this side, and the vein would be medial to it. And you will now see the, the bifurcation. This goes further. You have the internal iliac artery as well there. And from here, you'll get the uterine artery that is branching away into and medially. So that's the uterine artery in front. And as you see further, you will see the ureter on this side crossing over the common iliac artery. This is the left side of the pelvis. We move further now into spaces. So it's important to know that to be able to get into this area, retroperitoneum, you are going to be operating between vessels, nerves, lymphatics, uh, and also the, the, the major structures like the ureter. So you need to know how to approach these spaces in which you'll be dissecting so that you get little to no damage to these structures and be able to navigate your place through. So you, these spaces, you have some midline spaces, and you have some lateral spaces. We'll look at a, a simplification of this picture later and towards the end of this presentation. But for now, let's understand that you'll have to go into these spaces, which are potential spaces filled with fat and connective tissue. There are eight in total, four midline and four lateral, the lateral being the pararectal and the paravesical paired spaces, left and right and the midline being the previsicle or the space of retsias, the vesicouterine, the rectouterine, and the retrorectal or presacral space. And each pelvic organ can be separated from each other by opening these avascular spaces. Let's start with the rectovaginal, which is one of the midline spaces, also called, I mean, it will, it will be approached through the pouch of Douglas. In this area between these two uh, uterosacral ligaments. When you open this space up by opening the peritoneum, you'll enter the space into which you'll get the denonvalus fascia. These two layers of the denonvalus fascia is the fascia, is the layer between which you should be dissecting, pushing the vagina in front and the rectum behind. This tough layer is actually the space that you will be able to dissect into without much bleeding. So this is how we would be able to dissect this space. And it's important to understand that you, when you open this space and you see fat, do not dissect into the fat. That's where you will now start getting bleeding. So you'll have to go above the fat because the fat in this area belongs to the rectum. So there is no fat over the vagina in this area. This is well specified and mentioned by a senior colleague of ours and a friend, Professor Shailesh Puntambekar, with the dictum, fat in this area belongs to 
the rectum. So if you have to dissect it, dissect it, pushing this fat away. And that is now the vagina in front and the fat with the rectum going away from your dissection field. So that is now becoming a safe area for you to operate. Now let's look yes. at it in, in DIE, in deep infiltrative endometriosis, unfortunately, you're not going to get such a space. So you'll have to look for these landmarks to proceed because without that, you will either go directly into the rectum or you'll open into the vessels or you will go into the vagina and you or you will leave the disease behind. So you have no, you have no option but to learn this spaces properly to be able to dissect and open this area. So now you can see opening up the space. And once you move further and you realize that this is all the nodule of endometriosis here. So the moment you see fat, fat is your friend. You will be happy. You now see the cirrhosa of the bowel there and you'll be able to safely push this rectum down with this nodule that you will then be able to free and eventually remove either by a nodular dissection, nodule excision, or if it's, uh, if it's too big, more than three centimeters or multiple, maybe even a resection and anastomosis of the bowel. So getting this space correct and dissecting it is very important. Now we move into the pararectal space. This is the space, as you have said, as you have as, as mentioned, it's next to or around the rectum. So it is pararectal. Only one structure as you open this up starts crossing this space transversely, and that is the uterine artery. So the ureter is always lateral to the uterosacral. That is important. Therefore, if you stay medial to the uterosacral, the ureter cannot be injured. And this space continues anteriorly into the paravesical space beyond the uterine artery, and which continues further as the previsicle, I mean para previsicle in front. So this is how this space is divided. You have the pararectal space on the left side, the ureter, the internal iliac anterior trunk, and the uterine. Beyond the uterine is the paravesicle space. So you have this space is further divided into the medial and lateral areas by the ureter. So you have the ureter going through, you have the lateral and the medial pararectal spaces, also called the Okabayashi and the Latsko space, but that's not important. What is important is to know that this ureter divides the pararectal space into the medial and the lateral. And what is this area here used for or important for? What is this area here used for or important for? So the medial space is where we have the inferior hypogastric plexus and the nerves. So you have to be careful and protect this area in the medial spaces. And in the lateral space, that's where we would actually be using for clamping the uterine artery at the origin. Now, we go into the further into, I mean, again, you, you will see these nerves and the, the the, for the further dissecting, you will see the hypogastric nerves and further lower down, you will come in through the hypogastric plexus. The lateral is the origin where you're using it for the origin of the uterine artery. Now, opening the retroperitoneum, obviously, I told you we could use it. One of the ways is the round ligament. So this is the round ligament area and then parallel to the IP ligament. So this is the entry into the, the spaces, the retroperitoneum. So the moment you go now parallel to the, the IP ligament, you open it up and you can safely control this space entry by pulling the IP ligament medially. The moment you open it up, you will see your friend, the ureter there already, and use that space now to further dissect and secure the ureter. You can see the origin of the uterine artery here that is obviously coming off the branch of this anterior trunk of the, of the internal iliac artery. The paravesical space. Now, this paravesical space, as we have said, is now anterior to this uterine artery. So this uterine artery separates the pararectal space 
and the part of the cycle space. This part of the cycle space is next to the bladder. So it's para, the cycle, para, bladder. So it's next to the bladder here. And you have the obliterated hypogastric artery on this side. This with one structure crossing over in between that is called the superior vesicle artery. So this is the uterine artery. This is the paravesicle space. This is the, the superior vesicle artery. And that continues as the obliterated umbilical artery. So that is the space that is paravesicle. Again, important for us, this is divided into lateral and medial spaces by this obliterated umbilical artery. The lateral space is for oncology and it's usually avascular, can be used for lymphadenectomies. The medial space is crossed by this superior vesicle artery and it is used for in endometriosis for dense bladder adhesions during TLH or in previous, previous scars where you have adhesions in the midline, you'll have to approach it from the mid lateral medial side, the lateral approach. And then you can also use it for ureteric reimplantations. We move further into one of the other midline spaces, the pre-vesicle space, the retias. It's hardly a space that we use in endometriosis unless you have a bladder nodule in the, in the, in the bladder and endometriotic nodule, but otherwise it's used in urogyny procedures and can be used in advanced stage cancers. But it is approached between these two obliterated umbilical arteries. You open the peritoneum, and in this space, as you further open it up, you will actually now again encounter fat. When you encounter fat, do not dissect into the fat. Push the fat down because again, as said, the fat belongs to the bladder. The fat does not belong anteriorly to the abdominal wall. So once you've pushed it down with all the fat, you will now see this space that is used for our either bladder nodule to be freed to free the bladder and excise the nodule and repair it, or for urogynecological procedures. We go now into the presacral or retrorectal space. When in this, when is this space important for us for endometriosis? It is important for us because you may have to go posterior to the urate, to the rectum to free this rectum for possible uh, resection and anastomosis in case of rectal nodules. And in case of uh, even a nodule excision, you will need to go into this space to free the rectum to allow for non-tension uh, repairs. So this dissection of the presacral space would again start craniocordial caudal, and you will start from the peritoneal rectosigmal junction towards the pelvic floor. Two planes of importance in dissecting is the interfacial and the presacral plane, and two fascia that are important for us because that's where we will dissect between these is the fascia propria recti that envelops the mesorectum and rectum, and the presacral fascia, which is the tolls fascia that covers the promontory and hypogastric nerves and protects them away as you dissect be below or behind the rectum. So going in this interfacial layer is avascular, and this is where the dissection should be carried out for rectal surgery. We have one more space, that is the fourth space of Yabuki, which is medial to the ureter at the level of the uterovesicle junction where it enters into the uh, bladder. And this is a site for separation of hypogastric nerve for nerve sparing radical hysterectomies but of importance is the deep uterine veins are passing just medial to these hypogastric nerves. So this area has to be occasionally dissected when you have to go very deep, dissecting all the way into the ureteric tunnel to separate a ureter that has been compressed by endometriotic nodules, causing maybe hydroureter and hydronephrosis. Now we go to the fascia. So we have covered the spaces. We are talking now of the fascia. We have cervical vesicle fascia of importance. We have endopelvic fascia. We have the denonvalius fascia posteriorly and the valdius fascia of the rectum. This fascia is important because fascia lack bivalvulast and dissection should be carried out in these areas, in these planes 
because when you dissect in these fascia, interfacial faces, it will lead to minimal adhesions as well. So a good knowledge of facial planes helps in adhesion-free and minimal blood loss surgery. So we start with the cervical vesicle fascia that covers the cervix anteriorly and laterally, continues the endopelvic fascia as it continues posterior as well. The bladder dissection in this play fascia will lead to leaving the venous plexus is beneath the fascia and therefore you'll have no bleeding and have a bloodless dissection. So it's important to dissect in the right plane to avoid bleeding in this planes. So we are talking of opening this fascia. When you're opening it up, you'll realize where there are some surgeons when you open this area and direct in, all you'll encounter is bleeding. Now, that is because you're not in the right plane. You go a little higher or a little lower and you're going to encounter bleeding. But when you open into the fascia spaces, following these, these areolar guide or the champagne effect guide that you see to dissect, then you leave the veins behind, below. See this? You will dissect in this plane without any bleeding. So, for bowel endometriosis, now, when you come into bowel endometriosis, you get a nodule like this that is hugging the uterus or the torus uterinus and obliterating the pouch of Douglas. You may need to dissect off these kind of lesions. And to dissect these kind of lesions, you need anatomy of these bowel nodules. So, the fascia that we are interested in is the fascia that covers, this is the pouch of Douglas. I mean, the anterior, sorry, anterior fold, the pouch of Douglas that goes behind the uterus here. And now in this fascia, this space here that is called the, the denonvillus fascia in front here. And this is the presacral or the retrorectal space. So this is the area of importance when you are going to open up behind the uterus. The blood vasculature, as you obviously anatomy, you need to know the blood vessel supply, the importance blood supply to us for endometriosis, for bowel endometriosis would be the middle rectal, the inferior rectal, obviously the branches of the superior rectal and the sigmoid vessels, and that should cover most of our blood supply in this area. These are all branches of the obviously inferior mesenteric uh, artery. Dissection of the rectum, we had discussed this uh, both in a case that is clear and in a case that is without anatomy, without an anatomical obstruction and in endometriosis. How are you supposed to approach this space to be able to get your bowel off the nodule, I mean, with the nodule, off the vagina, off the cervix, off the torus uterinus? to be able to now leave the disease and eventually dissect off this disease. Further on, moving to anatomy needed for endometriosis, we are talking of the ureters. The ureters structures, it's one of the longest structures in the abdomen. It enters at the pelvic brim, crossing the right, crossing the external iliac, the left, crossing the common iliac. It stays medial to the interior, the anterior trunk of the internal iliac at all times. So you have to keep that in mind that the vessel is lateral to the ureter. There are three major areas of risk of injury. The near the IP ligament at the pelvic brim, where the uterine artery crosses over it. Uh, that is at the entrance. I mean, where you're going to like probably even a hysterectomy where you're going to now have to ligate the uterine artery. If you go too low or too lateral, you're going to get the ureter there and near the uterosacrals as it enters the ureteric tunnel. So it's important to know that the vascularization of the ureter is mainly from the renal artery, the ovarian artery, the, the iliacs, and then the uterine artery. So those are the main vessels, but then it has a very rich adventitial cover with a uh, arborization of vessels going through this adventitial layer. So the important thing is you could cut off this vessel or a, a, a uterine artery branch to it or an iliac branch to it. But as long as you've left this arborization 
of vasculature on this adventitia intact, this blood supply will remain intact throughout. So you will not be able to have any problem to vascularization of the ureter as long as you do not strip this adventitia. Do not strip it even for a centimeter. If you, you have to see the peristalsis going through the adventitia, never ever should you see the ureter bare. If you see the ureter bare beneath the adventitial layer, then know that that ureter is going to leak. So you'll have to stent it and probably consider repair of that area. How do you dissect it? Do you need to dissect it? Well, it is very necessary to know dissection of the ureter for every advanced laparoscopic surgical procedure. So the medial approach is usually used in endometriosis and the lateral approach would be used in oncology. So when we start off with dissection of the ureter, so we would, we would probably be able to dissect it off completely. You can see the vessels there, the uterine artery going over it. You can see branches of, of the vessels. You can see it on the adventitia. You can see this, this adventitia layer kept intact. So all through, that is very essential when understanding how to dissect the ureters. So dissecting the ureter without keeping this knowledge in mind is likely to end up with damage to the ureter. That's the ureter on this side. You can see the peristalsis. Do not strip off this adventitia of the ureter. This is the distances that we are talking about at the, at the uterosacral ligament and then at the tip of the uterosacral ligament near the torus, it gets pretty close before it moves over into the ureteric tunnel. Lymphatics, more of important for oncology. Nerves. These are some of the nerves that we need to know so that we can spare them because in endometriosis, nerves could be infiltrated and would cause pain in different areas. And that now has led to neuropelviology over the years. The nerves of importance could be obturator, genitofemoral, the pelvic splanchnic nerves, the hypogastric nerves, the hypogastric plexus, and we have discussed about how to identify the hypogastric nerve on the lateral pelvic wall. The hypogastric nerve carries the sympathetic fibers, moves further down to mix with the S23 to form the inferior hypogastric plexus. And the key to this plexus is the deep uterine vein. So dissecting near the deep uterine vein has to be very careful because you might injure the hypogastric plexus. And Important to note, staying medial to hypogastric nerve at all times, when you're going to use to curve, to cut the veins in nerve sparing surgery. So this is the, the, the vasculature, I mean, this is the nerves uh, plexus in the pelvis. We have both somatic nerves of importance and then we have the autonomic nervous system. So another nerve, this is somatic nerve on the lateral pelvic wall. You can see this is going further down. You can see the ner obturator nerve here. And below the nerve is the, the veins and the arteries. So importance in case you reach to a nodule that is this deep or importance in lymph, lymph node dissection and removal. So when we are now talking about the 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 vasculature, this is how now we would have to understand the arborization of the architecture of the retroperitoneum before moving. Finally, we have the diaphragm. So we also have a lot of, in as an endometriosis surgeon, eventually we may need to understand some of these lesions that occur on the diaphragm. So we have lesions of endometriosis causing adhesions of the diaphragm to the liver, causing fenestrations, causing scarring, causing nodularity, causing bleeding into the pelvic, into the, into the pleural cavity. So this anatomy is important. The area of importance to us is please stay, please stay. These are the lesions like for endometriosis. Please stay obviously lateral, keeping in mind that the phrenic nerve is medial the inferior vena cava foramen is medial on the central tendon of the diaphragm. Then you have the 
aorta, which is way out of your field because it will be more on the left side, but most of the endometriotic lesions are on the right hemidiaphragm. But this area is thicker, the lateral is thicker. As you go medial, it gets thinner as well. So you have to be careful in dissecting of this area in case you have to approach the uh, diaphragmatic lesions. Takeaway message, take home messages, obviously important 10 ones that I would want you to go with. The uterine or cervical pathology does not cross the sacral promontory. So in case of difficult situations, use the sacral promontory as the index to go downwards. Dissection should always be parallel to tubular structures, never cross tubular structures, otherwise you'll injure them. Tubular structures here meaning the ureter and the vessels in the pelvis. Always identify fascia and remain outside or between the fascia so that you do not bleed and you get a bloodless field of dissection that also will lead to minimum adhesions. Remain medial, remaining medial to the ureter will avoid damage to the internal iliac artery. Remaining medial to the internal iliac artery will avoid damage to the obturator and external iliac artery and vein. Fat belongs to the rectum. Fat belongs to the bladder. The ureter always lies in the fork between of the artery and the vein, the uterine artery and the vein. And because it carries its own mesentery and blood supply, dissection of the ureter can be started from the pelvic brim, completed all the way up to its insertion to the bladder safely if you maintain the mesentery and the arborization of the vessels around the ureter. There is usually very little variation in pelvic anatomy. So knowing this anatomy should help you guide your way through this pelvis in even the most difficult of situations. And during ileobturator lymph node dissection, remaining anterior to the obturator nerve will prevent damage to the vessels. So that was my presentation. I'm just now going to take you quickly through this in a pictorial way so that now I will lay down these layers for you. You have these three layers, the bladder and the ureter, the uterus, now put on next to it, the ureter entering the bladder here and the vessel internal ilia going obturate, obliterated umbilical artery and uterine artery entering into the uterus. Put further layers in front of it in the midline, you put a rectum here and now you have your space anterior to the bladder, the prevesicle or retsius. Between these two, the utrovesicle. Between these two, the poucher douglas. And then further down, the rectovaginal. Behind this, the presectoral or rectorectal. On these lateral spaces, we have the pararectal and the paravesicle spaces. Now put in further layers in there. And you will now get the you will now get the the vessels now the nerves coming in so the nerve is medial to the ureter the nerve is medial to the ureter and you have to protect this nerve and the plexus in front there which will be further deep to the deep uterine vein here moving further and creating more spaces and layers over this area you will see the external iliac artery going all the way, no branch in the pelvis, the inferior epigastric branch there, the vein medial to it, the vein medial to this branch here. This is the deep, uh, I mean, the internal iliac vein, which is usually very deep. So going again further, you will now lay out the muscle, the psoas muscle on which you get the genitofemoral nerve here next to the external iliac. You have the lateral cutaneous femoral nerve just lateral to the muscle, and then you have the ileoinguinal and ilohypogastric nerves here. Going further and laying another layer out, you will see outside this area, that's the ileolumbar space that is lateral to the external ilia, but in between this space, you have the obturator fossa in which you can dissect. You can see these areas are divided, the pararectal is divided into these two by the ureter, and the, these two spaces, the paravesicle is divided into these two lateral and medial by this obliterated umbilical artery. And this four is the 
fourth space of Yabuki, which is medial to the ureter as it enters the bladder. So final layout, as you move further, you can see that lateral to this ilo obturator, ilo, ilo lum, I mean, iliolumbar space, this is usually used for neuropelviology and lymph node dissection. We have laid over the tubes there, the ovary with the IP ligament crossing over these vessels here. And that is now the final layout of the pelvis. So when you put in one by one structure, I believe it makes you understand this a bit easier. Uh, so with this, obviously, I think I come to the end of the anatomical uh, course. So now I will again ask you, do you know your anatomy for endometriosis surgery? Thank you very much. These are our upcoming webinars in March and in May. Kindly feel free and I would re highly recommend you to uh, join these webinars as we move on. Thank you very much, everybody.